one Vancouver Radio episode 134. So, uh, three episodes ago, I had uh, two guests on my show, Gary Turner, Will Barton, and we did a lot of discussion on kind of depression, body image, um, the kind of, especially relating that to the fitness industry and how we are seeing ourselves and the actions people take. And this was obviously a fascinating topic, like, really fascinating and i think it's a big problem in the fitness industry there's an awful lot of people that are struggling with the way that they look and are struggling with their kind of mental perception of their body the actions that they take so i felt that i couldn't leave this topic i felt that the the podcast that we did with gary and will we kind of opened a can of worms and i've recently had uh, lots of messages on the show it's been some amazing feedback on twitter and uh, Gary himself has you know, got a lot of messages of people reaching out. So I decided to get Gary back on the show. Gary, hello. How are you? I'm really well, Ben. Thanks for having me back. And yeah, again, thanks to all the listeners. There's been some great feedback. Um, I've got to say, a lot of the feedback has come directly to you, saying fantastic format. Well done for setting it up in the way that you did. Um, also, Will, for his honesty, uh, given the understanding. I just think that the, that the podcast worked really well, um, and that's thanks to the way you set it up. So, you know, thank you, because if you didn't put us out there, we wouldn't be able to help as many people with the understanding. So, yeah, thanks for me as well. Well, uh, that is the aim. The aim is to help people. Uh, nothing more, nothing less. Um, now, Gary's been swatting up on this show. We've just been talking about uh, all the <laughs> all the books that he's read since we last last spoke um and it kind of brings up the topic before i segue back into the the purpose of this podcast uh gary you're an amazing speed reader i would like (laughs) to know this skill now (laughs) please explain (laughs) speed reading is really really simple um when when we read we'll generally make the sounds in our head we sub vocalize um, so that's the first thing that happens is so as we read the cat sat on the mat we'll be moving our lips our jaw our throat our tongue our palate everything that generates speech even if we don't think we're moving it we will be um, uh, we will be firing up the most neurons will be firing up we'll be getting little micro movements in there we can only read therefore as fast as the sounds that we can make so if you turn off making the sounds one of the ways is to put your tongue hard on the roof of the mouth for example Neurons that fire together wire together, and it will deaden the self-talk, which will mean as you read, you'll be not carrying out the sub-vocalizations. You'll be seeing the words, and that'll be going straight to meaning, rather than seeing the words, hearing the sound to meaning. It cuts out the slow part of it. So put the tongue on the roof of the mouth is one way uh, to, to speed people up with their reading, turning off the sub-vocalization. The other way is the back skip. We'll generally read a, a few words and then we'll back skip a little bit and then read it again, back skip, and read it again. If you get used to just look at your finger on the bottom of it and as you read, just allow that finger to move smoothly with the tongue on the roof of the mouth, you've turned off the sub-vocalization and you're stopping the back skipping. And very quickly with a bit of practice, you can just see the word, get the meaning No sound involved, no back skipping. It's just a really quick way to speed it up. Wow. That's gold. So, I mean, this is probably a bit subconscious for you now, but when you read, are you literally got the tongue on the roof of your mouth the whole time? No, I, I, I see the, yeah, when we get, when we get, when, when we understand words, the way we process words, we'll generally see the, um, see the symbols of the words and see the symbols representing sounds, like we see C-A-T written and we hear the sound cat. We make the sound cat in our mind. The cat will then go to this representation we've got of a, I don't know, whatever a cat represents for you, a black lion, three-year-old cat or whatever, and then that forms the images and the thoughts in your mind. When I read, I just see the letters. I don't see any sounds. I don't hear any sounds. See the letters and go straight to meaning. Just bypass the sounds. I've, I've been doing that since I was a kid. So I'm quite lucky that way. That, that is wicked because, well, reading is something people struggle with. I think, you know, this is just one reason why my podcast has been uh, successful because it's been put in a format where people can easily understand things. So I think if people 
you know, there's been times where I've read a book and my mind's just hopping all over the place. Now, granted, a lot of the time I, I can focus and drill down, but I do think it's one reason people don't pick up enough books. They can't just engage in it. Yeah, it's the, other, the other thing with, with, with books, and it, it, indeed any mental focus, um, we've got about seven to ten minutes. We, we work really hard for about seven to ten minutes intensely. And that's generally about all the attention that we've got to give to a subject. So if people find it hard to read uh, or their, their attention starts going, do a little seven, ten minute burst. A little seven, ten minutes, give yourself a quiet place, away from any distractions or whatever, um, and then just allow yourself to, to read it. Seven, ten minutes, and then leave it, move away, and then go back and repeat it again the same day, and then go back and repeat it again later on that day, then revisit it next day, then a couple of days later, then the next week. What you're doing is you're, you're in short little bursts, giving yourself the attention and focus that you need. And then by repeating it several times, again, neurons that fire together, wire together, you're starting to um, fire and wire uh, the neurons the same time every way. And you just, what is it called? Long-term consolidation. You, you, you lay it down into a longer-term memory. So that's laying the memory down. Then if you want to re, um, uh, want to remember what you've written, um, then you need to practice the recall as well. So as I'm reading a book, I'm putting it into practice. I'm putting it into context. I'm thinking, how can I, how can I apply this to someone? Uh, how would I explain it to someone? And then I'll practice recalling it as well. I'll go for a run with the Huskies. Uh, and when I'm out running, I'll be thinking things through in my head. OK, how would I explain this to Ben? Um, how would I put it to him in a way that he can understand? Uh, and I'll be thinking, how would I present this at a workshop? Uh, what are the practical applications of it? I'm practicing recalling it again and again and again. Uh, sometimes there'll be a key point in my study that um, is, is in my mind, uh, and I put it on Facebook, like a, um, a quote from a neurologist or something. Uh, I'll put something up there for discussion. Um, and in doing so, every time I, I, I get a, a, a click on Facebook, um, other people are starting to question it, start to analyse it, and it's just embedding it further. So um, the, the quick method is speed reading, tongue on the roof of the mouth, following the finger, no back skipping until you learn to just follow it quite nicely and you won't back skip and you can have no sub vocalization without the tongue. So it's tongue on the roof of the mouth, no back skipping, turn off the sub vocalization, no back skipping. Seven to 10 minute bursts, all the attention that we've got. Repeat two or three times one day, repeat it the next day, a couple of days later, the week after, a couple of weeks after that. So it keeps it fresh in your mind and that helps to store it in memory. The second side though, is you need to call it back out of memory uh, so if you practice recall, uh, especially if you practice recall with context, like uh, explaining it to someone, teaching it, telling someone, um, applying the, the, those um, the skills that you just read, then you're practicing the recall. So one time your, your speed reading will help you take in the information really quickly. Repeat it several times, seven to ten minute bursts, and that will start to store it. And then you practice recalling it as well, and then you know where you filed it. There's a quick couple of tips. Wow. Now that is some cool information. You said you were writing a little ebook about this. Is something you're going to do or have done? It's something I'm going to do. Um, it's, it's a skill that I think should be out there. So I'm just to put the bare bones, you know, only, only 15, 20 word ebook, uh, 15, 20 word ebook. <laughs> yeah, speed read now. Money back. <laughs> um, I'm, so I'm going to be doing a, a, a very quick ebook on speed reading, photo reading and quick ways of learning just to give people a heads up chuck it out there for 99p i'll probably make some money out of it at the same time but this information is worth getting out there because if you know people like yourself who've got this thirst for knowledge it'd be really good if i can help people do the shortcuts to uh, you know to learn quicker mm -hmm. and learn more effectively well when you've written that ebook send it over and i'll uh, i'll send it out to my list and we will earn you some money good sir anyway you're a star thanks ben the purpose of this podcast, so I want to delve more, I suppose, primarily into body dysmorphia. I think I think it's a real problem area in our industry. And, you know, from the comments that I've got, it's evident that people are struggling with this. And hopefully, part one went a little bit um, sort of to answer those kind of things. But one, I got a, an email after the show. I'm going to share it and we'll just pick out a few key points from that email and then we'll kind of build on the show. Um, 
But I, I had to share this because this is, this is what we want to happen from the podcast, right? So this email is from Mari. I hope I sp- pronounced that right because it's M-A-I-R-I. Hello, Ben. I hope you don't mind me emailing, but I'm not confident enough to comment on Facebook. I wanted to say thank you for the amazing podcast you did on depression and mental health with Gary Turner and Mil- Will Barton. I found it really inspirational and feel that that it helped me take away some of the stigma often associated with mental health issues. Having suffered from an eating disorder and anxiety since I was a teenager, I found that weight training and the environment in gyms can be both a negative and a positive influence on recovery. On the one hand, seeing myself make progress in terms of my strength keeps me motivated to ensure I eat enough and stay healthy. But on the other hand, the often competitive focus on aesthetics and weight loss can be a hard mindset to avoid. I originally started weight training three years ago after being told I had a low bone density due to weight loss when I was younger. But it's since become something I love. I have, however, experienced the stigma associated with mental health issues. In particular, the fact that I'm not seen as being part of those who need to lose weight and can't join in the conversations about diet plans and cardio or what to do. I train at a gym where there is a big focus on weight loss and 15-week transformations. I've always felt somewhat on the outside and I found, found myself being treated differently by people at the place I train when they find out that I've suffered from anorexia. This is why it was so refreshing to hear a mental health issue being compared to an injured hamstring with the emphasis on the fact that recovery is possible. Listening to Gary and Will has re-inspired me to refocus on what really matters and I've since listening sought out a new personal trainer who focuses on mindset, nutrition and weight training with a view to overcome the wall I seem to have hit in my own training. I am so pleased with how far I've come already and your podcasts have inspired me to keep moving forward. Apologise if I have waffled on, but I just wanted you to know how helpful your podcasts are in encouraging change and how great it is that you can cover all areas of health and fitness, even though you have no experience, personal experience of. Woo! There's definitely some kind words there, that's for sure. So, I mean, let's let's look at the the positive and negative aspect of the gym, Gary. Like, if we were to contextualise what Mary is sort of struggling with, how do you think people should approach the gym and what's going on around them? Because really, this is because st- we talked about this a little bit the first time round. This has got to be an internal focus on why you're there and the goals you have rather than the goals others have and it being an external influence. Fully agree, fully agree. Um, I picked up that uh, our friend there said that she felt that she was on the outside of the group. But is she on the inside of her own group, in her own mind? It's all about the individual. Um, I had a, a, a soldier in this morning for hypnotherapy. And we were talking about, uh, not about such body dysmorphia, but we were talking about training as part of it. And I said, I'm I'm just on a a couple of weeks cutting out because I want my six pack back because even though I'm 44, you know, there may be the rare occasion I'll take my top off in the summer and I want to look good. Um, I don't need a six pack to perform at what I do. I just went out and did a 19 mile run yesterday. I'm still doing the ultra marathons. It's the end of my ultra marathon seasons. I tail off for the summer. Um, and I don't need a six pack to run an ultra marathon. In fact, a little bit of fat to burn can be quite a good thing. So for me, I'm purely going to get the six pack back just to look good. It's not about how others perceive me, it's about how I perceive myself and how I feel about myself. For me, it's kind of the achievement thing of, yeah, I can still do it. I still got it. I'm getting old now, but I can still do it. Um, but for other people, um, especially the, the, the younger generations, those under 30, for example, um, there's so much pressure to have the perfect physique. And no one ever has the perfect physique. If you talk to any of the physique models, um, any of the models, um, they'll, all be bits, they'll all have bits of their body that they don't like. Um, there's a couple of people that I know that are in the public eye and they're always stressing about their bodies 
but they've got the body that the majority of people would think would be perfect. What I get across in my workshops, um, and what I get across especially with my weight loss clients and uh, those with body dysmorphia even, is it's okay to be happy with where you are now whilst allowing yourself to be better. Mm. Because it's, um, it's, a, oh, it's a, I'm showing my age now, Genesis, for those of you who can remember, brilliant frog rock band, um, Genesis, headed up by Phil Collins. They had a, um, an album song called Squonk. And Squonk was this mythical creature that everyone was chasing, trying to capture, trying to capture it, trying to capture it. And when they finally did, it just dissolved into tears. It's all about chasing your dreams. And when you actually get it, it doesn't actually represent what you thought it would. Um, so everyone's trying to go for this perfect body image. No one's ever going to achieve it for them. So why not just be healthy, be happy, be happy with where you are now while still trying to be better or while still allowing yourself to be better? That way you can be the individual that you want to be. Bear in mind that 90% of, or more probably of the uh, magazine and media articles were all airbrushed. They don't actually look like that. You pick up FHM or any of those magazines, if they're still around, I don't know, um, and they're not real people. They're airbrushed representations of real people. So it's about being individual and, and what makes you happy rather than the, uh, the others. And besides... People who follow fashion follow others. People of style, they're the individual. And you've got to think then, do you want to have style or do you want to be an individual? Just just some thoughts. Okay, I get that and I understand that. And I think a lot of people listening to that will understand that. But I think people will now go and the next time they look in the mirror, there'll be, there'll be 60, maybe 70% of them that is resonating with what you said. They'll, that 70% will go, I like who I am. I like, yeah, yeah, no, I'm happy. And then that 30% will, will come into play when they turn to their side or they turn around a bit or they look at a different area of their body and they go, oh, but, yeah, but I still want to do that. And, oh, and I'm still a bit fat and my chest isn't big enough or my ass is too big. How... How do we force people or empower people to shift that focus? Because I know, I know what you're saying. I know what you're saying. I love myself, but, but I think these buts are still getting the better of people. First thing you can do is the, the classic linguistic agreement frame in your mind. Just imagine every time you hear but, you change it to and which is a lot more permissive. But is a word that a good friend of mine, Rintu Barzu, if you want to learn some really cool linguistic skills, for example, um, get his book, it's a couple of quid on Kindle, The Persuasion Skills Black Book. Very clever book. Every line in the book is one of the language patterns he's teaching you. It's sure, it's witty, it's fun. And it will teach you things like the word but, delete everything that comes before it. So I need to, oh, my butt's too big. Uh, I, I, like, I like the way that I'm going. But I need my butt to be better, for example. Much easier, more permissive to say, oh, I, I like my body and I need my butt to be better. Just replace the word but with and, and it links movement to it. But deletes what comes before it and will um, um, form a connection and move that thought on with the new. That way, again, you're being more permissive with yourself rather than working against yourself. It's a way of turn off the self-talk. Um, it's a way of turn off. It's a way of adjusting the self talk. It's a way of just thinking about things a little bit different. Every time you see something, yeah, that's looking good, but I need to work on this. Just change it to, yeah, I'm looking good, and I need to work on this. It's a lot more permissive. It's working with you rather than against you. It's just one of the many ways of, literally, it's using your word, empowering yourself um, to to be the person that they want to be and you want to be. Mm. It's, a, it's a difficult thing as well. I think that's fascinating, and I can I now see what you mean, and I can visualise it myself because uh, I've talked about this recently on the podcast, and I'm I'm not quite ready to divulge all, all yet, but um, I've been seeing a therapist as well, and there's so much of what we've talked about, and um, and I I really recommend. There's probably a point in everyone's life where they need to go and talk to someone or have therapy. Because I, I just see ev literally everyone I meet, there's just a not a little demon inside them, but there's, a, there's something from their childhood or their past or their pattern that has 
maybe created a lifestyle or a trait in them that is holding them back from achieving something or contextualizing something. So when I was talking to my therapist, it, there was an awful lot of, you know, my, my mindset is, is fantastic. My, my, I'm in a very good, I'm in a very happy place, but how I contextualize some situation, she wanted to adjust. And for her, it was a case of, I kept using, I should a lot as in the expectations that others place on me rather than I could or maybe I could do that or I decide yes or no whether that's beneficial and you're right she worked so much on me empowering myself with the thoughts that I had. Yeah there's a shortcut to all of this um, and I'll, I'll never see a, a client again the moment that everyone realises everything is just their imagination. It's the, the neurological process of perception. We take in all the stimulus from the outside world, it passes through our thoughts, and then we, we form our perception of that reality, our imagined version of reality. So what I do is, uh, I mean, hypnosis is where someone's imagination is guided so much that it becomes their reality. So hypnotherapists will be guiding people's imagination, getting them to imagine what they need to imagine to get the result and be the person that they want to be. So what I say to people is just imagine what you need to imagine for it to happen. So, for example, if people um, say people aren't in the shape they want to be, then get them to imagine what they need to do to achieve what they want and get them to imagine what they need to do to mobilize and motivate them towards it so they can actually take those steps. But all you need to do is imagine everything you need to imagine to get the result. Imagine being the person that you want to be in every context, in every way, the one who can easily, effortlessly, unconsciously do the right thing at the right time in the right way for the right effect, just nailing everything, working out what they want to have happen, what they need to do to achieve what they want, and taking those steps, with a smile maybe. So in other words, it's using the imagination. And once once people use the imagination the right way, then they won't have any obstacles. Um, speaking of obstacles, a lot of obstacles come in the form of a metaphor, and uh, in the email, I think she said she has a wall. Would that be right? Uh, I don't know. Of course, from the end, I picked up the, the wall. Yeah, overcoming a wall, I seem to have hit in my own training. <laughs> yeah, I mean, for, for, for a therapist that studies, say, clean language, symbology, and especially um, up here, Andrew Austin's metaphors of movement work, uh, Cognitive linguistics, look at the work of uh, Lakov, for example. Uh, when you're hitting a, a wall, um, that, that wall, that's a metaphor that represents so much that goes on in the background, so many thought processes in the background. That wall will represent how they've learned to be that way and their future expectations. And they need to overcome that wall. So the wall's an obstacle in front of them. Uh, how do you need to get past that wall? Well, climb over it. How big is that wall? Can you go around it? Can you go under it? Can you go through it? Do you need assistance? Do you need some resources to get over it? Imagine what you need to imagine to easily and effortlessly get over that wall. Um, it's a metaphor. Most people have something holding them back. But what's holding them back? Is it someone hanging on to you? Is it a bit of rope? What is it? Imagine what you need to imagine with that metaphor to free yourself up, to allow yourself to move. If there's an obstacle in front, what do you need to do to get past that obstacle, to get over it, to get around it, to get under it, to get through it? And it changes the mindset. Imagine what you need to imagine. Because when she says the word wall, it's got a huge, deeper structure of meaning beneath it. So although she's using a metaphor of a wall being an obstacle, it represents so much her thoughts, her experiences, her future expectations. Change the way that she deals with the wall. Allow her to imagine climbing over it, going round it, going under it, going through, whatever she needs to do to get, to get past that wall. And then she can continue without that obstacle. Not only that, she's learned how easy it is to remove obstacles from her way, to get around it, under it. They can deal with it. So it's just changing, just changing the thought processes again. Imagine what you need to imagine. I like this. Uh, and I'm actually going to use kind of two examples that's happened. Well, no, one example that's happened to me recently and something that I can think you'll understand uh, with kind of your work and the kind of subject we're on. I was uh, speaking to a group of trainers. I kind of did a bit of a sort of uh, an intensive mastermind session last week. And we were talking about the psychology of coaching clients and how many individuals 
you know, struggle with the, the change aspect of their clients and not getting them to do what they want them to do. Now, one of the things I said is I said, well, you as a trainer, have you ever sat down and closed your eyes and put together all the variables in that person's life and got to an emotional place where you understand where their emotions are right now? So if you're a, and this is an easy context to, to put into place, if you've got a young trainer who's 22 and is dealing with a 40-year-old woman um, that works a job, looks after the house and has three kids, have you ever sat down and imagined what it would be to be a female at 40, four stone overweight, with three kids, with a job, having to do the housework, organise their children's after-school activities, the time constraints, and I sort of said to them, have you ever done that? Have you ever really pictured it and understood it? Because you can't understand it because you've never been there. But as soon as you start to understand, you start to see that the stresses that this person would, would, would kind of go through. And kind of my other example is, I suppose if we look at potentially anorexia, now please bear in mind I'm no expert on anorexia, but from my understanding... People get into a thought process where they see their body in a constantly fat state. They will look in the mirror and they have programmed their brain to visualize that whatever state their body is in right there and then, they are overweight and they need to lose weight. And that is a very powerful visualization. That visualization is bypassed what is physically in front of someone and that we know is potentially factually incorrect. So we've programmed our beliefs to become the reality. Yeah. Here's, a, here's something that threw me. Here's a curveball a client once threw me in a session. Um, just to generalise and shrink it down, a client had come to see me, and it was because, let's just say, that their reality wasn't the same as the rest of the world around them. Uh, I'm not going to diagnose or anything. That's someone else's place. Um but you can imagine the sort of diagnosis this person may have got with a psychiatrist. And she came in and um, I said, so I said to her, so what are here for today? And she's like, I don't know. I've just been asked to, to come along. Okay. Well, from my understanding, you're experiencing the world in ways that other people aren't. Um, it's almost like you've got a different reality at times. Would that be right? And she looked at me and said, how long have you felt this way? I'm sorry. Well, obviously, you're having certain delusions if your reality is different to everyone else, because I'm perfectly fine. And I suddenly thought, this is through the looking glass. Whose reality is actually real? Is it mine or is it my client's? Mm. Uh, am I the hypnotherapist or is she the hypnotherapist? Am I the one that's in therapy? What's actually real and what's not? Um, so we started to play a game. What is reality? It's like, okay, this is a pen. Okay, for me, this is a pen. It's a pen, it's this colour, and start describing it. Is this reality for you? Yes, it is. Cool. Let's pick something else. Here we go in a mug. Picked up a mug. You know, it's an orange mug. It's, we start describing everyday objects to check that we had the same shared reality. And then I was getting her to pick one. I would pick one. She would pick one. I would pick one. And she picked a sound. And I'm like, I can't hear that. I can't hear that at all. That's not there. Where's it coming from? There, okay, let's see if there's a source there. And we discovered by exploring their reality that actually there were things outside of other people's reality. We looked at it rationally. If there's no source for the noise, no source for the talking, where could that talking be coming from? And she started to accept that, hang on a second, um, maybe my reality is not the same as the actual reality. Bear in mind we perceive things anyway. Um, so I started to use logic and rational reason to actually work through how they experience reality. And I taught them to question their reality, gave them like homework, a training drill to start questioning what is reality and what's not. And it put her in a much better place where she could come from this mild state of incorrect perception um, and correct things. I had a client last week with body dysmorphia. Um, and what I did was get them to close their eyes and imagine seeing themselves in the mirror. And this client was amazing. She was in incredibly good shape. Um, she probably had the body that, you know, 99% of all women would, would, would want to have for themselves. Yet for her, she was really fat. And it's like, I couldn't see that, but my client can. So I'm not going to tell my client she's wrong because her experience is actually quite right. In her mind, she's seen herself in, in this, you know, as, as being overweight. Um, 
So I got her to every now and again, close her eyes, and what happens now when you see your body? And I was getting her more and more to actually look at the details and look at what is actual reality, separating emotion from reality, to look at their bodies with logic and rational reason. And it was a way where at the end of the session, uh, I've got to catch up and see how she's getting on. But at the end of the session, she was closing her eyes and looking herself in the mirror and seeing her for exactly what she was, exactly who she was in touch with reality, separating her perception from the reality. And it's freed her up quite nicely um, to open up her thought patterns on the whole area of body dysmorphia, how she handles her nutrition, her training, all the personality traits and thought profiles around it. Because now she can see exactly what she's got. It's much easier for her to move it and shape it how she needs to. So does that make that make sense? Yeah. Oh, this is fascinating. Okay. I want to segue directly into the kind of big body dysmorphia question that I've got. So um, we had a guy on the podcast... I think it was around episode 21, and his name is Dan, and I had him on the show, and Dan had had uh, surgery on um, his chest for kind of excess skin, and I sort of talked him through it and how it had changed things, etc., and he's written in an email uh, recently, and I want to dissect this because I think this exact issue is rife in the fitness industry, and I think this context can help us expand it, so... Hi Ben, I hope you're well. I think I have a problem that I think or I feel needs addressing, that I think I can't be the only one who is affected as a male. Muscle dysmorphia. I was on one of your earlier podcasts regarding my gyno surgery I had back in 2010. We briefly discussed my surgery and to why I had done this. Long story short, I started off at 113 kilos at my heaviest, carrying 27% body fat, which was in 2009. 2010 was my surgery and my weight loss has carried on steadily from then on. I'm currently 72 kilos, 27 years old and probably in the best shape of my life. But why am I still not happy? I have visible abs, good muscle proportion to my frame, I'm healthy. This is where I think I have a problem and I'll happily admit it. People compliment my physique on occasions and I can feel myself getting angry with the person for paying me a compliment. Maybe I feel like I don't deserve the compliment as I am still not where I want to be. I'm very overly self-critical and when people do say nice, nice things, I feel like they are undermining me as I'm not what I think of myself. Everyone else just sees me for what I am now, which could be for the average Joe is enviable. However, I see what I once was. I am hard on myself and out of a fear of turning back to my former self, I'm constantly striving to better myself and my image. I don't do this for anyone but me, but I do wonder if anything else will ever be enough. I'm still very body conscious and feel uncomfortable taking my top off in public. I feel as of late when I'm dieting down for my holiday, it's playing on my mind more and more and the last thing I want is this becoming a major problem where this affects me and my loved ones. I have a good job and a home life. I have a good balance between this and my training. I've removed myself from social media as of late due to how much body image has become a major part of the fitness industry. Being shredded and eating donuts, this just isn't the right information for the general public. People that appear to be using substances but claim you can get a body like them with a 16-week training and diet plan. It's setting people up on false hope and when the end product isn't great, where does it leave people? Disheartened and discouraged to carry on. I hope you can shed some light on this as I believe a lot of bigger a lot of a bigger situation than just myself. But I could do with some guidance and I reckon others can. Yours, Dan. Well done, Dan. I think I think most of us are jealous of his uh, physical condition. Uh, so that's really good. You know, you're in the best shape that you say. Uh, well done, Dan. I really like that. I I was picking up so much during that, and I know that people in my profession will be picking up on it as well, especially those um, that study a bit of cognitive linguistics, the thought processes behind the words that we use. Uh, he says a lot. I think. I feel. Yeah. So one, I think, I think is your best guess. Yeah. Uh, you don't actually know. So there's questioning. He's unsure on that. Um, 
went to see a doctor. He said, I think you're torn your cruciate ligament. So what have I done then? Oh, I think you're torn your cruciate ligament. Yeah, but what have I done? Well, Gary, I've told you twice. It's not going to change the third time. I think you've torn your cruciate ligament. Right. You're not going to recommend anything until we've got the correct pathology and you know what I've done. Well, what do you mean? I think you've torn your cruciate ligament. Yeah, I think tells me it's your best guess. You don't know for sure. Otherwise, you would have said you've torn your cruciate ligament. I think being a filler, which mm, I think that I'm still this way. So what he's doing is he's, what Dan's doing is he's thinking, part of his personality is getting him to question. He's not quite sure. What would happen if you were sure, Dan? You said that you're in the best shape. What happens if you realise that you actually are in the best shape, that you don't think it, you just realise? There's one thought. Also, um, I'm going to probably get this wrong now. There's a book by Penna Baker. It's one of my favourite books. Watch out for the geek. Um, the Secret Life of Pronouns. It, it's an amazingly interesting book because language is so much part of our lives. And you can do things like spot when a government's moving towards war, for example, just by the pronoun usage. Um, and I'm laughing at the pronoun usages taking place in uh, the, policy, the, the political uh, arena at the moment with the election coming. There's uh, something like 273 words in the English language that define someone's identity. They all get grouped into me, myself, I, and you. Um, and each one will represent a part of the personality in that context. If you listen to the, the podcast again and reread the email, there's a lot of I, I think, I feel, I feel being the, the physiological reactions to the feelings behind it, telling me he's emotive as he's thinking about it. It's I, I'm hard. I'm this, I'm hard on myself. It's all I, 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 I. Represent the part of personality in that context. It's quite funny that I'm hard, I'm hard on myself, which means that one part of personality is being hard on the other part, which means the part that's being hard upon is being put upon by some... They're working against each other. They're not, they're not working aligned with each other. Um, and it... it from, from my point of view, I would strongly suggest that Dan goes to see uh, an experienced... Um, um, psych worker, um, someone like an experienced um, hypnotherapist, uh, a good psychologist, a good cognitive behavioural therapist. Uh, I'm not so sure on counselling for this respect because there's too many key markers for the other the other one, the CBT, the, the psychologist and the skilled hypnotherapist to work with. Just to sort out his personality and get it in line with himself so we can move forward quicker. Um, cognitive behavioural therapy, the cognitive side of it, will get him to question the I think and I feel and get him to separate the reality from his perception again. So he, they will te teach him to use logic and rational reasons, look at himself, so he can realise exactly who he's supposed to be. Um, there's a lot in that. Um, the self-talk that they're playing on my mind because if you're looking in the mirror and part of his personality regenerating itself, talk going, oh, I'm not sure of that. I think I think that needs to be improved. I think this, I think that. We can we can bring that online. Um, go to my blog page um, and put in put in Gary Turner blog, critical voice one, and follow that process. After you got used to turning that voice off, now we can get used to actually helping it, turn it around, helping it learn to be different. So go to Gary Turner blog. Um, critical voice part two and we can help that part learn to be better so Dan may actually have that uh, ability to go and do that follow through the process um, and, and get the result he needs without seeing a, without seeing a therapist initially um, checking how his work goes and taking it from there but it's a, I think that's a positive email because he's nearly there he's nearly there it's like he's put the car together everything's in the right place he's got the fuel he's got the oil everything's absolutely perfect and he's pushing the pedals and using the handbrakes off and he's using the, the, the levers and he's turned the wheel but nothing's happening all he needs is to turn the key yeah because I, I I very much see what Dan's written there as the same same scenario as why I went to see a counsellor or a therapist in that I knew everything that was going on I knew the problem I knew all I needed was someone to literally connect the wiring and change the language slightly and I was literally there. Yep, yep. There's a lot of people like 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 you um, who just yeah, everything's there. I mean, a, a skilled therapist. Oh, I, I'm, I'm a hypnotherapist. I wouldn't call myself a therapist. I give psychological skills training. It's the easiest way of 
you know, some of the soldiers come in, no soldier needs therapy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, they've got the same as a pull, pulled hamstring. You know, they need the right attention, the right skills, uh, the right right rehab, uh, as an in injury rehab, to, to allow them to be on, on, on the right path again. It's only psychological skills training, really. I just help my clients apply that to themselves to get the results. Um, there's a lot of people like you that are just so close. They just need that professional bit of coaching. No different to being in the gym and maybe you're doing a deadlift and you can't improve your PB. So you hire a coach to check your technique and correct your technique and just make those little adjustments. Oh, just angle back slightly. Oh, my God, I can get another 10 kilos. That's right, because now you're working with your body. So just as much as have a coach, a coach to help you work with your body, a coach to help work with your mind is just as important. I... Uh... I think this is going to be a lot more of a future direction for a lot of people and you know we can really draw on the importance of this that we all understand that the mind controls every action that we have the the mind creates the thought which creates the belief and if we don't get those beliefs right it will make us take actions that could potentially be negative and we'll all invest in our diet plans, we'll all invest in our training and our supplements, but no one's actually going, perhaps I should sit down with someone and just get someone to just check my thought process, because my thought process might be a little bit faulty, might be a little bit extreme, perhaps I'm not bearing in mind my family, my situation, my environment, and if anything, this investment should probably come before diet and training and all the rest of it because it's it's the most powerful component i think if i've learned anything today just by talking to gary i feel that i really want to put on some kind of big seminar or event where we we get gary in a room with a lot of people because i think i think more of this stuff needs to be positioned with people that would that'd be really cool i'd love to do that um and the, the whole thing is it's like sports performance Every performance starts with the mind. So, for example, uh, if someone's a footballer, um, it's all about the mind. It's 100% lies with the mind. It's not about the skills. It's not about the, uh, the strategies. It's not about the conditioning. It's not about the playing and practicing. It's about the mind. Because if the mind's not in the right place, they're not even going to go trade it. Mm-hmm. It all starts with the mind. You're quite right. The mind and the body are intrinsically linked. Uh, I mean, the way I describe it is uh, your neurology. You've got the central nervous system, the brain, the spinal cord. It's about the size of your brain. You've got small hands, you're buggered, as Andy Austin once said. Um, if you're blonde, you've got small hands. I'm only joking. I'm only joking. That's the size of your brain. So you've got your brain, you've got the spinal column going beneath it, out to the peripheral nervous system, down the limbs. And when you think, your, your body will fire as you think. Every time you have a negative emotion, your body will tense up and close off slightly. Every time you have a positive emotion, you'll relax and open up. And can I just say, I've not really got massive hands. It's just a perspective of working on my phone, honest. Um, but yes, you've got your neurology, the mind, the body, uh, they're intrinsically linked. You can't work with the body without working on the mind. You can't work on the mind without impacting the body. So if, if you're only training the body, you're, you're missing out on, on, on half, of the, uh, half of the game. That's for sure. This is fascinating. I think actually what I'm going to do, I've made the decision right here and now, the, um, the Body Type Nutrition Conference, if Gary's available, uh, will, will actually be a three-day event this year and we'll make the theme of the conference um, about the mind and about the power of the mind. And uh, obviously at the Body Type Nutrition, all the co- uh, coaches get to come and uh, deliver a 45-minute talk because all the coaches on our team are incredibly knowledgeable and valuable. But the next uh, conference we're going to do, we're going to pull in other people, great people in the fitness industry that need to be heard. So um, that is going to be our theme for next year. I've already decided it. How about that? Gary, you up for that? 100%. How could I not be? How could I not be? Look at that. I put It'd him under pressure. you in the flesh and shake your hand as well, you know? When when you put people under pressure in front of twenty thousand people, um, it's hard to say no. Um, right. Um, I want to bring up one more topic now. Um, Gary mentioned he got a good few questions on this after the first show, and I, it's an interesting one because it's probably one of the comments which goes against how we commonly view depression and the negative mindset, and that there is no chemical imbalance. 
And that was one of the things that people got in touch about Gary about. Now, I had a question that I didn't get to ask last week, or I don't think I asked. Uh, Gary, feel free to correct me if this is not the case, but I am a huge believer in how powerful food affects the body. And I've spoke a lot in previous about how food intolerances will affect different parts of the body. They'll create inflammation and inflammation can affect the brain, the organs, the skin, the lymphatic system, the blood, everything. Now I know how powerful food and intolerances can affect disease states, symptoms, etc. So can food-borne issues play into depressive mood states? I believe so, and I also believe that it's a, a, an under-examined area. Just to backtrack on the chemical imbalance, there may be a chemical imbalance, it's just that there's been no evidence for it. What we've got is we've got chemicals like the monoamines, uh, we've got serotonin, we've got um, norep norepinephrine, there's, there's a few chemicals at play in, in, in depressive, um, depressive conditions. And sometimes it's that there's not enough of the chemicals floating around. Sometimes it's that there's too much. Sometimes it's that there's a receptor problems. Um, sometimes the, the neurotransmitters aren't reaching the right place or being regenerated enough. The problem is, is that there's no real test for it and it's relatively new science at the moment. Um, chemical uh, interventions most definitely do have uh, efficiency. Uh, and the, the fish, you know, so they should never be discounted. Um, yet, CBT, cognitive behavioural therapy, for example, has been shown to be as efficient, i.e., as effective as chemical uh, uh, approaches as well. So you can work on it from um, a, a cognitive a thought process, behavioural, the way you behave, the way you move through time and space. Um, uh, approach, and it's just as effective as taking the chemicals at the same time. I believe it's also potentially more important to do the, the cognitive and behavioural side because you're dealing with the root cause, not just masking the symptoms, which the chemicals, if not used appropriately, may do. Uh, interestingly, you want the best results. It seems to be the chemicals, the pharmaceutical interventions and cognitive behavioural therapy. That's what the, that's what the studies are showing. Um, so it's not so much that there's no chemical imbalance. It's more so much that the pathology isn't there. They can't prove it. They can't show it. It's not. It's not there. Yes, yeah, serotonin, dopamine, um, norepinephrine, uh, the monoamines. I've got to read those. I haven't got those in my mind. Um, they're, they're definitely playing a role, but the actual exact nature of the role isn't fully identified yet. So the drugs that are given out by the, the pharmaceutical companies and the doctors do have efficiency. Uh, and for anyone that doubts their efficiency, saying it's big farm and all that, read uh, Bad Pharma by Ben Goldacre. There are drugs out there from the Cochrane Foundation that's had a look at them. Uh, the meta-analysis actually do have efficiency over placebo. That's a geeky side of side. Um, but on the food side, yeah, the food we eat, it, it has to affect us in various ways. How it actually affects us... Um, it's not researched enough yet. Um, the, the books that I've got here, I mean, I've, I've got a brain behavior, cognitive neuroscience book. I've just gone through a cognitive psychology book. Um, I've got, oh, what's this one? A little study book. It's a little, little rehab book. Abnormal clinical psychology. It's a revision book that I've got. Uh, and they don't cover nutrition. There's, there's very little on nutrition in any of these books. Yet we know that nutrition affects us so much. We know that depression can make us feel bad, for example. We know that it can have adverse effects on our body. That definitely will play a role in the overall scheme of things, especially with people with depression. So if we can clean up people's diets and get their nutrition right, so their body's responding right to the nutrition, the, the foods that they're ingesting, then their body's going to be in much better position to deal with everything else at the same time. The inflammation thing I'm researching, I actually put a blog on Facebook, a blog, a post on Facebook this morning, because I'm not fully aware of the, the overall impacts of food on uh, inflammation. It's a word that's thrown around a lot, but I'm not sure exactly of the role of it. We get an inflamed response. If I cut my finger, for example, I'll get inflammation as, a, as the body works to repair, to repair the injury. That'd be acute inflammation. Uh, chronic inflammation... And how, say, there's, there's a lot of popular press out there, popular uh, pop media, um, that sugar, for example, will cause inflammation. 
What information is that information? Where? For who? To what extent? Does someone have to have a condition for this to take place? What's, what's the actual role of it? Is that information different to the inflammation that people say is happening from trans fatty acids or, or wrong ratio of omega-3 to omega-6? Uh, is it the same as the inflammation that's happening um, from eating the, uh, the, the chemical additives in our food? So it's information just in itself is this massive area of nutrition. Um, and my gut feeling is if we focus on getting people to eat food that's the right food for them, you know, whole food from natural sources, for example, uh, properly prepared, eat when hungry, stop eating when no longer hungry. Um, that would be the ideal, the ideal world. Get the nutrition right, the body will be right. If the body's right, the minds can be in a lot better place full stop. Yeah, see, I mean, if I was going to sum up how, you know, nutrition should really be approached as a whole, I've always said that we know that any food can be a reaction to someone. The The body reacts in a plethora of ways to different foods. Now, if you are in tune with your body and you listen and you notice that a food is having some kind of effect negatively on the brain, the skin, the guts, um, your concentration, anything, then the chances are you shouldn't be eating that food. It's just one food that's not right for you, should be omitted, and that is going to get you closer to what we will describe as optimal health and performance. And really, that's what it comes down to. We can't be too dogmatic about certain things that the majority should avoid when there's going to be individuals that will need to avoid some things, you know, and, and it can be really strange. Some people will get an itch on the back of their throat when they eat strawberries. Now, just the small itch might be part of the symptom. The symptom might actually go a lot deeper. The pathway of problems might go further. So you should listen to that minor symptom and probably say, okay, strawberries aren't really for me. I'm going to omit them from my diet because I don't know what the long-term ramifications might be. And I think really that's how we can probably draw the aspect of food and depression and just any adverse effect um, in anyone's diet, really. I agree with that. I agree fully with that. I did an experiment where I dropped from 108 kilos. Right when my fight career came to a close, I dropped from super heavyweight, which I was basically eating Battenberg cake and everything, <laughs> where everyone gave down me to maintain that heavyweight, um, just so I could fight the super heavyweights. Uh, I did a weight cut, and I went from 108 kilos to 84 kilos in 14 weeks. And I did it by making one change every week and monitoring it. I was taking my overall body mass. I was doing my uh, just using Tanisa scales, but it, it kind of it kind of runs. Although it's not accurate with the figures, it runs accurate with how my body was and how it was changing. So I was I was measuring my weight, my my um, my lean mass, uh, my water retention, and I was seeing what was happening with each little intervention that I did. One of them was I went gluten free. I made sure that I was replacing the carbohydrate element with other non-gluten carbohydrates so it, I wouldn't have glyc glycogen depletion and lose the water fluid mm -hmm. from that, for example. I lost two kilos in two days and then stabilized just by going gluten-free. Um, so I would suggest that in my body there is a, a, an inflammatory response from gluten or other things in the foods that contain that gluten. And it's only by doing that intervention to see what's happening in my body that, that I, could, I could see the result. Um, recently, I just did a, a little experiment of white, white bread doesn't agree with me. Yeah, um, let's just say that the door in the gym is always open if I'm eating white bread. Yeah, um, it's just it just doesn't work with me. So I thought, okay, what is it about white bread? Because I like bread, I like bread. Why not eat bread? It's nice. Um, and it's just, I, I remember um, there's um, a, a baker's that used to be in Acton, and they properly fermented their bread overnight. They allowed it to actually properly ferment. And even celiacs, people who are you know, severely gluten intolerant, allergic to the, the, the gluten, they were able to eat the bread from there because it was properly prepared. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, okay, remembering that. Or, or what's the difference between white bread then and wholemeal bread, whole grain bread? So I've started eating wholemeal bread. I have no problems at all on wholemeal. If I have a day where I have a couple of slices of white bread, gym door open. If I'm on wholemeal bread, gym door can stay closed quite nicely. It's just like playing little experiments. What works for people as an individual, I guess? Mm. See, that's fascinating. It's exactly what happens to me if I have cow's dairy. My major symptom is uh, I kind of put on about half a stone of fluid. 
um, in a space of about, well, it kind of happens overnight and then it lasts three or four days. It's really annoying because I just look fat and then it, it goes again afterwards. But again, I've listened to my body and I've worked this kind of stuff out. Um, so listen to your body, suss things out. Uh, I need to say thank you for to Gary for coming back on the show. It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, Gary, if people want to find you, where do they need to head to? Tell them again. If they need to find me, they really need to see a therapist. So if you need to find me, uh, you can find me. Uh, my website's garyturner.co.uk. Uh, you can find me on Facebook. I think I'm actually wearing this top of my Facebook picture at the moment. Um, so uh, you can find me on Facebook. My friend's with Ben, so you can connect with me through Ben. You can find me on Twitter. Um, you can find me. Uh, it's, just get hold of me, garyturner.co.uk. It's got my contact details. Uh, I welcome feedback. I really welcome questions. Hook up with me on Facebook. Hook up me on Twitter. And, yeah, I, I ask, ask questions. Um, I'm connected to a lot of quite cool people, to say the least. They always say it's not who you know, so it's not what you know, it's who you know and what they know. Um, so it's a nice little environment on my Facebook page. You get some good discussions going. Um, obviously, I'm connected to, to, to Ben Coombe on social media as well. And you, know, you can find me on, on Ben's page. He welcomes discussions taking place there. Uh, yeah, get hold of me on my website or, or on social media. and look forward to chatting with people. Gary, that's really awesome. Uh, I'd recommend uh, finding Gary on Facebook because I've I've seen a lot of his discussions um, when I used to look in my news feed on Facebook, and they're good. Like Gary, really just opens up thought, and he's genuinely one of those people that is happy to just say, "Look, what's your opinion? Let's spitball on this. Let's go for it." I'm not the guy that knows everything, and I I really, really, really like that. Um, look, everyone, I hope you've really enjoyed the show. If you've enjoyed the show, please do me the massive honour of sharing it with someone. Send the link to someone. Say, hey, look at this show. They don't even have to listen to the rest of all these podcasts that I've got. You know, bear in mind there's 133 hours of free information here. Just send it to them. Empower someone with a bit of information. When you see it on Facebook or Twitter, give it a share. Give it a like. That's the only way people are going to see this information that is new. And... Please, if you haven't done so already, please jump on over to iTunes and leave me a review. Um, that's how new people find the show via iTunes. And, you know, if more people paid attention to this, I think more people would discover a greater level of health. So um, I will be back on the show next week with Rachel. And once again, Gary, thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me on, Ben. And thank you for giving so much stuff for free. That's the thing. Ben's doing this for free. Yes, yeah, okay, he gets a bit of marketing out of it. But the, the stack of information on these podcasts is gold. The, the, just listen to the podcast is probably better than most other nutrition courses out there, for example. So thanks, Ben. You're doing a lot of really good service. And, yeah, keep it up, mate. Well, thank you. But let's, let's not uh, question the other nutrition courses out there too much. Eh? <laughs> You'll get me into trouble. <laughs> right, thank you, Gary. And I will speak to you all soon. Goodbye. Hey everyone, Ben Cooper Radio, episode one, three, three, yeah! Uh, um, I'm a little bit excited, Rachel, I'm going to be honest. I'm excited because, well, it's many things, I'm going to tell you why. I'm going to tell you why I'm really excited. The weather at the moment in the UK is freaking stunning. 